hide that one even. If you want, Carl, get it. So anything we say from this point forward can be held against us. <laughs> So we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Jennifer Bush. I'm the director at the Johnson Homework House Museum. And tonight I am here with Gary Baker to present Beatles and In the End. So 1969 to 1970. Um, and this is the, the, the final um, presentation um, from a few years ago when he presented on the anniversary of the White Album. Um, so just, just a few things. Uh, we're going to wait to do uh, a Q&A at the very end. So um, hold your questions until we get to a, about probably 7 o'clock, 7.15-ish, right? Hopefully. <laughs> um, hopefully we don't go, go too long. Um, so we also have a few videos on here. Um, we're hoping that the audio works. Um, we're not really sure about copyright issues. So if you don't hear any... Um, any any music or any um, talking, just bear with us and we'll we'll continue through them. Um, and then one other thing is um, we are we are on screen sharing and um, we're not exactly sure if we can get out of screen sharing and go right to a camera view so you can see us. So we may have to end this video and then start a new one to do the Q&A. So um, this is the first time we've ever done this, so just bear with us, and I hope you enjoy. So I'd like to turn it over to Gary Baker. All right. Thank you, Jen, and uh, uh, welcome. I hope the uh, troops are gathering out there. Uh, obviously, I can't see you, and you can't see me because, as Jen said, we're on screen share, which right now is, is a bit of a false term because uh, we're not actually sharing the screen with the uh, uh, with the Beatles slides, so you're, I'm just going to be the uh, the voice from behind the curtain, I guess, as the uh, the folks said in the Wizard of Oz. But uh, we'll get started here in just a second, and uh, I'll get a high sign from Jen when she says it's okay to begin. But in the meantime, just welcome, just welcome to uh, the Beatles, and in the end, and as Jen mentioned earlier. It's a continuation of the White Album program we did here at the museum in uh, 2018. So we're taking you to the last two tumultuous and crazy years in the life of the Beatles uh, before they broke up and, and became no more and became the legends, of course, that we all know them as now. So uh, thank you, and we'll get started here. Uh, first of all, the legal stuff. Uh, as Jen said, no copyright is claimed in this presentation, including but not limited to photos, music, video, or other content. And I assert that any alleged infringement is permissible under the fair use laws, uh, fair use principles in U.S. copyright laws. It's for educational purposes. And the Johnson Humrick House Museum is a nonprofit organization, and this program is sponsored by the Ohio Arts Council and the National Endowment 
for the yards. So that's all, that's all getting all the legal stuff out of the way. Now, I'll share just a little bit about me. And the first thing that I'll tell you is I'm a Beatle fan. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a first generation fan. The very first song I ever played in a band was the Beatles song, the Paul McCartney song, Yesterday. I've made two trips to Liverpool, England, and four trips to London, England, and at least 12 trips across Abbey Road. Uh, the photo you see above there is me on the left, and uh, my two friends, the Pandolas in the middle, and my wife on the right. So I'm portraying uh, George Harrison in denims and white uh, tennis shoes. Jason is portraying Paul McCartney, although we decided it was too chilly to take his shoes off that day. Jen is portraying Ringo Starr, and my wife, all dressed in white, portraying John Lennon in the very best photo that we've ever had taken of us uh, at Abbey Road, that famous, famous crossing. I've taken photos there before, but this one turned out the best. And uh, also, I've done about 25 three-day Beatle conventions in New York City, Chicago, Cleveland, and Columbus. Read well over 100 books on the Beatles, and... Uh, I'm a 40-year Beatle record collector and dealer. Of course, I've bought records since the Beatles first started here in the U.S. in 64, but I've actually collected them seriously as a hobby and as a dealer for the last 40 years. And I've seen Paul, to my best recollection, uh, live in concert eight times and Ringo with his all-star band six different times. So that's a little bit about me. I've uh, co-hosted some radio shows with Mike Bechtel, for the White Album and Sgt. Pepper and a number of other albums. And we've done a couple of other programs here at Johnson Humrick House. And then as I laughingly said, I've owned every Beatle album on vinyl, reel to reel, eight track and CD. Uh, the photo down here at the bottom where I'm pointing the arrow is me in front of the famous EMI Abbey Road Studios. And the photo on the right is me back in 2014 on the 50th anniversary of the Beatles uh, on the Ed Sullivan Show, and that is at the uh, famous Ed Sullivan Theater where the show took place and they redid the marquee for a few days back in uh, 2014 in February to commemorate that. And it's, it's a chilly day there. Uh, these I'll just skim over quickly and tell you. The top row is my wife and I in Liverpool. The middle row is my wife and I in London at various Beatles sites. And the next few rows are famous Beatles celebrities. Pete Best, original Beatles drummer, Cynthia Lennon, John's first wife, Patty Boyd Harrison Clapton, uh, both the wife uh, of George Harrison and eventually of Eric Clapton, uh, the late great Billy Preston, uh, Louise Harrison, George's older sister, Ruth McCartney, Paul's half-sister, the great Victor Spinetti, who was a uh, co-star in three Beatles movies, and of course, again, the Ed Sullivan shot. So, that takes us up to very, very late 1968 as we lead into what happened in 69. So just a quick history, picking right back up where we left off from our last show. The White Album was released in November 22nd of 1968, also known as just simply The Beatles, the two LP set, which you all recognize over here and probably still have on either vinyl or CD. A couple of things important happened in late 68. And that was that Abbey Road installed a new solid state recording console called the EMI TG serial number 12345. So I think they just made that part up, right? But that's the console that they put in, and it's now solid state. We've gone from analog and tubes to transistors and all that good stuff. And they now have eight track technology available, which is important. And another interesting thing is on December 11th of 1968, a mere three weeks after the release of the White Album, John appears on a British TV show. Now, the show never aired, but it's now available on DVD. But the intent was for John to appear with a supergroup on that show that they jokingly called the Dirty Mac, which in English vernacular means the Dirty Raincoat. Okay, so kind of a silly name with the great Eric Clapton on guitar, Mitch Mitchell of the Jimi Hendrix Experience on drums, of course, John Lennon right there in the middle, and Keith Richards of the Rolling Stone playing the bass guitar. 
So talk about a super group, Rolling Stones, Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, Experience, and The Cream all in one, all in one band. So that's what was going on in late 1968. So we turn to 1969, and right after the holidays, uh, this is a working band. Uh, even though they may have been worth millions at this time, what they loved doing was playing and recording music. So they got right back to it, and on January 2nd, we see the Beatles returning to a studio, not Abbey Road studio, but I'll tell you about this studio in a second, after the holidays to begin filming and recording what they're calling at that time their Get Back film and their Get Back album. They're going to get back to the old time rock and roll that they used to play. But they didn't do that in Abbey Road Studios. They do it on this giant sound stage that you can see here called Twickenham Studios in London. And you can see how massive this space is and how dark and dank and probably a little chilly in January in London. And here are the cameramen as they're recording originally for TV, but we all know it turned into a movie called Let It Be. But the original concept was a television documentary of the Beatles making an album. So here they are gathered around with people filming, film people in their faces. Here's Yoko and John. And uh, it got tenuous. It got testy. And on the 10th of January, George Harrison said, I'm leaving. I'm done. Now, he does come back six days later but he comes back with several conditions for the other Beatles, and that is that they'll leave the dark, damp Twickenham Studios and go to their brand new Apple Studios that have been being constructed during this time, and that there will be no live performances that Paul has been hinting to the press that the Beatles might do three shows around London, live shows. And George says, I'm having none of that, and I'm not going back to Twickenham. I'll only return if we go to Apple. So I want to share, if this works, uh, it'll be a happy day. I want to share George explaining to the other Beatles that he wants to do a solo album. And here's why this is important. There is turmoil amongst the group. One of the things that George is upset about is he has accumulated a massive number of songs, 20 or 30 songs, and he can only get two songs on a Beatles album. So here is George in his own voice, and hopefully this audio comes through, uh, chatting to, you can hear John, you can hear Paul, and you can briefly hear Yoko's voice on why he just needs to seek out and do his own solo album, but... He still says he would return uh, to the Beatles, that that would just be a side project. Okay, so I'm told by Jen that that's not coming across, so we're going to move on to our next slide, and we're going to chat a little bit about moving in to Apple Studios. And when the Beatles move in to Apple Studios, they find that the studio itself is really not ready to accept uh, their recording. They, they can't go in there and record right away. And 
the reason for that is, is this little fellow right here, whose name, ironically, is Magic Alice, Alex. His name was actually Alex Martis, and he was a friend of John's, and he thought he was an electronics wizard, and John thought he was an electronics wizard. So he thought that he could go in and create a state-of-the-art facility even better than what the Beatles had at EMI, which is also known as Abbey Road. And so Alex created the Beatles studio in the basement of the Apple headquarters at 3 Savile Row in London. And so if we talk about the Beatles and the Apple that you see on the label, this studio is in a business district of downtown London, and they have just completed what they think is a brand new state-of-the-art facility. And in that new state-of-the-art facility, they've also added a new producer where George Martin has been their producer in the past. This gentleman, by the name of Glenn Johns, is their producer on this album. So here's Glenn with the remaining four Beatles in the basement at Apple. But something happened. The electronics were no good, and they had to be torn out and replaced by Jeff Emmerich. And Jeff Emmerich was an excellent engineer, and Jeff was the engineer who won a Grammy for engineering on the Sgt. Pepper record. He also did some of the engineering on the White Album, and uh, uh, he did the engineering on the Abbey Road Album. But on this album, they asked Jeff to come in and assess the situation, and he said, this equipment is garbage, it needs to be torn out and replaced. So we'll see if this little video of Alex plays uh, better than the last one did. And uh, if it doesn't, uh, we'll let it play without sound because you'll get an idea that uh, Alex was kind of an interesting character. So here's a little bit of Alex. This is George Martin. So hopefully you were able to hear that, and if not, uh, what George Harrison was sharing there at the very end, as you saw George appear on screen, was that uh, Magic Alex never did anything that worked, but John was always very impressed with him, and so that's why they allowed him to build the studio, and it was a complete mess, and as I mentioned before, they had to tear it out and start over. So there were several days delay while well, they got substitute equipment into the ba uh, to the basement of Apple Studios. While this is going on, uh, and as the studio got completed, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, I'll share with you the songs that they recorded from January 23rd to 29th in the basement Apple Studio there on Savile Row. And they recorded the songs Get Back, The Two of Us, Maggie May, Dig It, I Dig a Pony, I've Got a Feeling, for You Blue, Let It Be, all songs from the Let It Be album, right? But they also recorded Isn't It a Pity that would be released on George's future solo album. And they recorded The Long and Winding Road, Oh Darling, which would end up on Abbey Road, Don't Let Me Down, and One After 909, which of course appeared on Let It Be, Teddy Boy, which Paul put on his first solo album, and I Want You, She's So Heavy, which John uh, put on the Abbey Road album. So that was what was going on in Apple Studios in January of 69. Near the end of January of 69, they wanted to have a climax for this film or this TV show that they were creating. 
They hadn't decided what it was going to be yet, but they had a lot of film footage. And they had decided they wanted to have a big finale for this show. And of course, the Beatles had grandiose ideas. And so the grandiose ideas for a final concert to go along with this film that they'd been recording in both the Apple basement and the Twickenham studios was perhaps they would go to the pyramids in Egypt and do a concert in front of the pyramids. Perhaps they would go on the ocean liner the Queen Elizabeth II and tape a live concert aboard the Queen Elizabeth ocean liner. And then they also thought simpler things like maybe we'll just do it at the London Palladium. But another neat idea they had, and my favorite idea of all the ones that they had was a Roman Colosseum in Tunisia that they wanted to go do that. So. I'm going to play a video of a little bit of an interview with Michael Lindsay Hogg, who was the director of the Let It Be movie. And he's going to share a little bit about uh, the idea of the Coliseum concert and how that was going to go. And then eventually a little bit about where they ended up. So I'm going to move this up to about a minute and 10 seconds here so we don't get a bunch of stuff we don't need. And uh, right about here, we'll start. Okay, Jen informs me that our audio is not working on that, so I'm going to share with you what director Michael Lindsay Hogg uh, told the interviewer there, that uh, they decided on using a Coliseum in Tunisia. John came up with the brilliant idea of putting all the Beatles on a ship, taking the ship with a bunch of fans on it, doing rehearsals on the boat, then getting to this Coliseum in Tunisia, where they would set up their equipment in the morning and the film would show that, and then it would show them getting ready in the afternoon, and then along towards evening, the, Be the Beatles would begin to play, and as this was happening, it was getting dark, people would be coming in across the desert, some on camels, some on horseback, uh, some walking, Peoples of, people of all races, creeds, and colors, and they would be converging on this Tunisian Colosseum, and they would fill the Colosseum in the evening, and the entire event would uh, climax with the playing of the final song, The Long and Winding Road. Now, wouldn't that have been something? Wow, you know. But of course, it would have cost millions of dollars even in 1969 to do this. But that was Michael Lindsay Hogg and John Lennon's concept for doing that. But the truth of the matter is the Beatles really didn't want to leave home. And so they had a lot of other commitments. They had enough other stuff going on. And so they just stayed in London. And so here is where the performance actually took place. It's simply on the rooftop five stories up on top of the Apple building at 3 Savile Row, London, England. By the way, here's a little trivia for you. I was back there in 2017 and the former Apple building that was Apple Studios and Apple headquarters for the Beatles in the early 1970s and of course 1969 as well is now an Abercrombie and Fitch children's store a six-story Abercrombie and Fitch, including the basement. So I was actually able to go down in the basement and look at children's clothing uh, in the basement where the Beatles had their studio. So here they are on the roof. They had to reinforce the roof with all this wood. 
They had to reinforce below in the fifth floor with beams so it wouldn't cave in and get all this equipment up there. I can't show you where it's at, but in this upper right picture above here, there is a skylight and they had to take that skylight apart so they could get amplifiers and here's Billy Preston's keyboard. Here's a keyboard that Paul was going to use, all these amplifiers, all this heavy film equipment. You can see all these guys filming with camera, movie cameras. They had to get all that through. So it came up through a skylight and then was lowered down onto the roof. So it was a massive undertaking and they did not make the decision to do this concert until January the 26th and performed it on January 30th. So in four days, they put all that together. Some other quick, cute stories about that was audio cables. The studio was in the basement, so they had to run all these audio cables to record all this from the basement up to the fifth floor. So all these cables had to be run a total of six stories. The engineer up top that day is this gentleman right here that you can see me pointing the arrow to, and his name is Alan Parsons. And some of you have heard of the group called the Alan Parsons Project, and so Alan is still touring with his band, the Alan Parsons Project. But that's him as a young engineer working at Abbey Road, and he has a walkie-talkie somewhere, probably in his pocket, and he is communicating to Glenn Johns downstairs so that they can communicate back and forth on sound quality issues. So here we have the late Billy Preston, Paul McCartney, John, Ringo, and then you can see George over here in the green pants. I want to identify these four people across the back. I don't know this fella, but this is Yoko on the left right here in front of the, in front of the uh, 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 furnace exhaust or whatever you want to call it. This is Maureen Starkey, Ringo's wife. This is Ken Mansfield. Uh, president of Apple Records in the United States, and beside Ken is Chris O'Dell, and she is an American, the only American working at Apple in the UK, and she is a, an administrative assistant. So those folks are all on the roof as well. Now, the other thing that happened as the concert was progressing, it was 42 minutes long, the police eventually were called for the Beatles disturbing the peace. So you can see back here the police coming up onto the roof, and if you've ever seen the Let It Be film, it's been out of print for a number of years. It was never converted to DVD. The last thing it was available on was VHS, and you could see the police coming up the steps, and eventually they had to shut the Beatles down for uh, disturbing the peace. Paul thought it would be quite fun if they came over, arrested the Beatles, and took them away in handcuffs, but that did not happen. So thus ends the last live performance of the Beatles in a concert setting, but of course you and I couldn't buy tickets. So now we get to a time between the Get Back, Let It Be film and movie and the Abbey Road sessions. Now, I wanna back up and tell you that the Get Back, Let It Be film and movie have not been released yet. It was fraught with problems from the very day it was completely recorded and from the rooftop concert. So it will be a number of months until it sees release. We'll talk about that later. But in between the Get Back, Let It Be sessions and the Abbey Road recording sessions, here's some things that happened. George had a tonsillectomy. The band started recording on a song that would end up on Abbey Road because called I Want You, She's So Heavy. And George would begin work on three songs, Old Brown Shoe, All Things Must Pass, and something. And on March 10th, John and Paul gave a big stack of tapes to that producer who I told you his name was Glenn Johns, all the Let It Be or Get Back tapes, if you will. And there were 10 or 15 of these giant tape boxes. And they gave them to Glenn Johns on March 10th, 1969. And they said, we're done with it. Take the tapes, create a record out of it, we're moving on to something else. So all the great songs that they recorded during that time, Long and Winding Road, Let It Be, Get Back, etc. They give the tape to Glenn Johns and say, take it, we're moving on. 
Another thing that happened in between uh, was uh, very, very important. Uh, first of all, Ringo began filming his first movie called The Magic Christian with Peter Sellers, and here he is here. But even more important than that, Paul marries Linda Eastman in a civil ceremony at the Marlebone Registry Office. And a couple of weeks later in Gibraltar, John and Yoko get married and here they are with their wedding certificate and the Rock of Gibraltar in the background. And we'll share a little bit about that in a second. On April 11th, so about a month after they've given Glenn John the tapes, they decide they will release Get Back as a single with Don't Let Me Down on the B-side. And later on May 30th, uh, they do, uh, John and Paul do a quickie recording session a couple of weeks earlier and record a song called The Ballad of John and Yoko, which is all about John's wedding and the week after and what he did on his honeymoon. So that was just John and Paul only because Ringo was unavailable and George was unavailable. So Paul played drums, bass guitar, rhythm guitar. John played uh, rhythm guitar, lead guitar, and sang uh, most of the vocals. So that's what was happening uh, in February, March, April, and May of 1969 in between these two sections. sessions. Uh, I'm going to play this video of Paul and Linda's marriage, and I think even without sound, this is still a neat one and you get a pretty good idea of what's going on. So at least I'll at least play a segment of it and uh, you can enjoy that. And of course, you can always Google that on YouTube and watch it uh, live later, even, even if the sound is not cooperating with us tonight. Unfortunately, as, as uh, we said before, you're not going to get any sound, but I thought the video was great here, even without the sound. And uh, what a wonderful day for Paul and Linda. And she really was the love of Paul's life. And you can just see how absolutely happy they both are. And uh, obviously, Paul was devastated uh, when Linda passed here. Gosh, I guess it's going on close to 20 years now. And so I just wanted to share that little bit of video with you. And we'll share this little bit of silent film footage as well, uh, a little bit of John and Yoko. And you can kind of think back to uh, 1969 and what was uh, happening. Of course, all of you aren't old enough to know that, but what was happening with John and Yoko at the time was uh, they got married in Gibraltar uh, and then they uh, went to Paris for a short time and then on to Amsterdam. 
and in Amsterdam they did what was famously known as the Bed In for Peace. And they spent several days in a hotel room in Amsterdam, I think it was at the Hilton Hotel, and uh, they were having a bed in for peace and reporters from all, all over the world came to visit them and they offered a message of peace in the midst of the Vietnam War and the chaos going on in the world at that time. And this is what we remember John, you know, the most for. And uh, we'll, just, we'll just play a little clip of that and you'll see them. Uh, it's pretty grainy stuff, but uh, it's just fun to see with or without sound. So a little bit about the wedding of John and Yoko, and as we all know, uh, a very successful marriage uh, that, of course, ended tragically on December 8th of, of 1980 with uh, John's assassination. But Yoko has continued to carry the candle of John's message of love and of peace throughout the world, and she continues to have songwriting contests in John's name every year. So... Uh, you know, Yoko is well into her 80s now. Of course, this is the 80th year of John's birth, and so he would be 80 if he were still with us now. And uh, so thank goodness Yoko has continued to carry on that tradition as well as uh, uh, their son, uh, Sean Lennon. So now we'll switch gears and we'll talk a little bit about the business of the Beatles because that's one of the really, really tenuous things that was taking place in 1969. Keep in mind that when we did the White Album session a couple of years ago, that their manager, Brian Epstein, had passed away uh, in the summer of 1967. So here they are in May of 1969 before they have hired anyone to manage their affairs. So think about being the biggest rock and roll band in the world, uh, generating millions of dollars in income yearly through the sales of record albums and, and uh, tapes and, and you know books and magazines and sheet music and anything else you can imagine. And they don't have anybody managing that. So they start a new company called Apple and it became a mess in a hurry and it was seriously, seriously hemorrhaging cash. So they had to do something, and on May 8th, 1969, they hired a gentleman by the name of Alan Klein. Now, Paul was not in favor of hiring Alan Klein. Paul wanted a gentleman by the name of Lee Eastman uh, and uh, his son, or his father, John, and uh, they just happened to be his father-in-law and brother-in-law but he wanted them because they were entertainment attorneys and he knew that they knew what they were doing and they would get Apple uh, out of this mess and get things cleaned up and get them back on a profitable basis in no time. But George, Ringo, and John were having none of it. They felt that he was too close to Lee Eastman. And so the three of them voted in favor of hiring Alan Klein. Alan had a notorious rep uh, reputation uh, as a manager, he was a, a no-holds-barred kind of a guy, a tough guy, and he had managed the Rolling Stones. And as you see the photo down here, you see 
uh, a suited up Mick Jagger and a suited up Keith Richards leaving uh, a magistrate's office uh, in London where uh, Alan Klein got them off on a reduced sentence on a possession of marijuana charge. So Mick and Keith are leaving the uh, courtroom uh, quite happy and Alan gained a reputation through that and many other things. So John felt very strongly about hiring Alan, even though Mick Jagger warned him uh, he could be a bit tough to deal with. And this photo I found rather hilarious because Paul is the one dissenting member of the group. And I think this is kind of a joke photo, but here's Paul with Alan Klein with a thumbs down. And that was very representative of how tenuous uh, that was going on. So what's Alan Klein do? He's going to cut costs. What's any good business person going to do when a company is losing money? He goes in, he fires quite a bit of the Apple staff, which a lot of them are Beetle friends and Beetle hangers on that have been there for a number of years. He also fights with Northern Songs to get the rights to their publishing uh, empire, which they do not own at the time. And actually in September of 1969, he negotiates them a higher royalty with their record company, which is EMI in the United Kingdom. And over here in the US, we refer to it as capital. So now finally, we've got to the beginning of the Abbey Road sessions in July of 69. And what's happening there is now we're going to begin recording a new album separate from the get back, let it be debacle, if you will. And we're starting fresh, new songs, new album, and we're going to go back, funny, funny that we say it that way, we're going to get back to, at, not to Apple Studios, pardon me, we're going to get back to Abbey Road. So they have this brand new Apple Studio and they're not going to use it for the second album that they could have produced there. They go back to Abbey Road, they go back to George Martin, they say, we want to do it the way we used to work together, not the way we work together on the Let It Be, Get Back debacle, but we want you to produce it. And George Martin said, I'll come back if we can do it the way we've always done it. And so July 1st, 1969 is the official beginning of the Abbey Road Studio sessions. Now understand, Abbey Road Studios is not a name at that point. It's simply EMI Studios and the address is Abbey Road. So there was no such thing as the Abbey Road sessions 51 years ago, but that's what we of course call it looking back. So John had told the other three Beatles he would not be in for the first week of recording to start without him, that he was going to take the automobile and with Yoko and Kyoto, Yoko's daughter from another marriage, and a young Julian Lennon, they are going to jump in the car here, the motor car, and they're going to drive up from London to Scotland and they're going to visit John's family, the Lennon family, aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews that all live up in Scotland. So they drive up to take Julian and Kyoto and Yoko to, uh, for Yoko and Kyoto to meet the family, and of course for Julian to go along, John's son, and John crashes the car. He's not a good driver, and even with his glasses, he's, he doesn't have great vision. So he receives 17 stitches, Yoko gets 14 in a crushed vertebrae, Kyoto gets four, Julian escapes without injury, but when Cynthia, Julian's mother, finds out that John has wrecked the car with Julian in it, she gets in her car, drives to Scotland, drives to the hospital, insists on seeing John in the hospital so she can give him a piece of her mind, and John tells the nurses not to let her in. So, so uh, Cynthia leaves, Without satisfaction, she picks up Julian and she takes him home. Fast forward eight days and Lennon returns to the studio. He's ready to begin recording again after the car crash. But Yoko is to be on complete bed rest. So he calls Harrods, has a bed ordered and delivered to Abbey Road Studios so that Yoko can be in the studio while the Beatles are recording, and he even see, sees to it that she gets her own microphone, not so that she can sing on songs, but so that she can add any comments 
or thoughts that she might have during the recording process. So here's Yoko in bed in Abbey Road Studios, and here she is with newlywed Linda McCartney, Mal Evans, the Beatles' assistant, and over here is Patty Boyd Harrison. So here are three of the four Beatle wives in the Abbey Road Studios in July of 1969. Now, on July 16th, John disappears, and Paul, George, and Ringo go ahead and record without him. So John was absent the first week. He's been there a week, and now he's absent again. So John leaves through around July 21st, and when he shows up on July 21st, he's got a new song, and the song is called Come Together. <clears throat> but I think if we had a recording that we could play tonight, what we would hear is a very different come together than what we're used to hearing. First of all, it would be faster than the version we're used to. And second of all, it wouldn't have that iconic bass line that opens the song. Because both of those were coming from Paul McCartney. Paul created the bass line and Paul said to John, hey, Let's slow it down and get more of a funky groove to it. And so that's what they did. And so in the meantime, while John had been gone, the three remaining Beatles recorded You Never Give Me Your Money, Her Majesty, Golden Slumbers, Carry That Weight, Here Comes the Sun, Maxwell's Silver Hammer, Something, Oh Darling, and Octopus's Garden all without the aid of John in the studio. Now, he may have come back in and overdubbed parts on a couple of those songs, but for the most part, he is absent on the vast majority of those tunes on the Abbey Road album. One last thing I want to share about the song, Come Together, that was originally intended by John to be a campaign song for Dr. Timothy Leary, the grandfather of LSD, and the LSD psychedelic trip, and he was running for governor of California at the time, and this was going to be his campaign song, but at the last minute, John decided he wanted to use it on the Abbey Road album, and he did that instead. I'm not going to play this one, uh, but I am going to show you this photo, and I want to share a little bit about a new instrument that the Beatles used in the studio during the recording of Abbey Road. And it's called a Moog or Moog synthesizer. And it had been used on some tunes as early as 1967. If, as you notice my little note there, it had already been used on albums like The Doors' Strange Days album, and even an album by the Monkees called Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones Limited which I owned as a child, and uh, both of those albums were recorded in 1967. So the Beatles weren't early to the party recording this in July of 1969, but the Moog or Moog synthesizer was just beginning to be an instrument that musicians wanted to have on their albums. So George purchased this massive Moog or Moog synthesizer in 1969, had it shipped to his house in six huge boxes, two keyboards and all these components back here, and started playing with it in his home. And when he thought that he had a pretty good idea of how to play it, he had it brought into the studio. They had a small room off to the side of the recording area, and they were able to reassemble it there and run all the wires and connectors directly to the recording studio. And so they anything that they played on the Moog was played from this little room and piped into the recording console. There are four songs on Abbey Road that feature the Moog synthesizer. It's used on Here Comes the Sun, Maxwell Silver Hammer, I Want You, She's So Heavy, especially listen for it at the end, and the song Because. Now the last two songs were written by John, so he really enjoyed it. The rest of the Beatles used it a little more judiciously, if you will. Paul used it on Maxwell's Silver Hammer, and George uses it 
on Here Comes the Sun. So there is Moog Synthesizer on four tracks on the Abbey Road album, and next time you pick it up and listen to it, listen for the influence of the Moog Synthesizer on those four Beatles songs, because it was new technology, and as you can see, it's quite a heavy thing to deal with. That gets us to time for the cover shoot. And the cover shoot for Abbey Road was shot on August 8, 1969. Now, as I told you before, Abbey Road Studios was not named Abbey Road Studios. That was simply the name of the road, the address of the studio uh, in London, England. So as the Beatles are thinking about ideas this far into the recording, they've been recording now for five weeks and they've got songs in the basket ready to go. What are we gonna come up with for a name? And one of the first thoughts they had, they looked down on the recording console and remember I told you about recording engineer Jeff Emmerich? Well, laying on the recording console, Jeff had a pack of his favorite cigarettes and they were called Everest King Size Cigarettes. And you can see there a drawing of Mount, the mighty Mount Everest on the front of the package. And one of the guys, perhaps Paul said, that's a great idea for an album cover. Why don't we fly over to Tibet, you know, rent a private plane, fly over there, stand someplace at a beautiful scenic view at the foothills of the Himalayas and get our pictures taken in front of Mount Everest and we'll call the album Everest like it's the pinnacle of our achievements. It's the pinnacle of our time together. And everyone thought it was kind of a neat idea, but nobody wanted to get in a plane other than Paul and fly to Mount Everest. So that idea got axed. So another idea that got tossed about was the idea of all good children. And of course, if you're familiar with the Beatles Abbey Road album, you know there's a song called Golden Slumbers at one part that goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven. So that was the idea behind the all good children theme. That got the ax. And a lot of people say it was Ringo that finally said, why don't we just go outside of the studio and take a picture? In other words, Ringo was a guy that should just break it down to the brass tacks. What are we messing around? Let's just go outside the studios and take a photo. Well, Paul took that to heart and he drew this sketch and brought it back to the studio the next day. This is Paul's original sketch. I mean, it's not, it's a copy of it. I don't own it. And you can see here's the street, Abbey Road. Here's the famous crosswalk. This is a fountain that you can't see that is situated back here uh, from, the, uh, from the photo. And here's even a sketch Paul drew out. So look at it. He really <laughs> drew it out quite accurately as to what they did. So this was Paul's concept once Ringo had said, let's just take the photo here at Abbey Road. And here's another sketch of it. And then here's a sketch of where the Abbey Road Studios would be located. And this is where you would travel as a pedestrian out of the studio door, down and across the street. And then the the subway station, the St. John's uh, Wood subway station is somewhere over in this area. So that was Paul's concept based on Ringo's idea. They brought photographer Ian McMillan in. He took six shots. Three were going from left to right and three were going from right to left. So they went over, back, over, back, over, back. Ian brought the film in a couple days later, processed, showed all the guys the prints, and Paul said, let's use that one because we're all in step. It looks the most even. It looks the most consistent. So that's the photo they chose. Now, here is the Bakers and the Pandolas photo taken uh, uh, over 50 years, uh, 50 years later, well, 2017, 48 years later. And uh, here we are as George, as Paul, as Ringo, and as John. And I think we did a pretty good job. And there was a little more traffic that day than what I showed, but I Photoshopped some of that out. But I did not Photoshop our location. And uh, uh, I think we did a pretty good job. And I had our tour guide take the photo, but I set him up 
and told him where to stand and adjusted the uh, lens opening on the camera. So uh, that's how we got the famous Abbey Road cover. The sessions are wrapping up now and on July 23rd, uh, they recorded the end with all four Beatles in the studio. The song, the end, the penultimate song on the album. The ending song on the medley and the next to last song on the album, of course, Her Majesty followed. These photos that I'm showing you here were all taken on the Beatles' final group photo session, the last time they would ever be photographed together, August 22nd, 1969, uh, in kind of a, a field and an area around John's home at Tittenhurst Park. It was this big mansion that he owned in what was called the Stockbroker's Belt of England. It was formerly owned by a guy named Cadbury, so you can get an idea of who that might have been, uh, an heir or perhaps the CEO of a very large English chocolate manufacturing company, confection company, the Cadbury family. John bought that and he and Yoko lived there for many years. So that's where these final photos were taken and uh, the very, very final session of any type of recording on Abbey Road took place on August 25th, 1969. The next slide I'm going to show you without sound, it's going to be kind of a bummer, but I still want you to watch it. It's only 50 seconds long and I'll talk over it since there won't be any sound. And then I would love it if you would pick up your Abbey Road CD or album tonight and play it after the show and listen to this bit on the song, The End, which is the end of the Abbey Road medley. And what we've got here is a gentleman that put this cover on YouTube and it's wonderfully done. And we're gonna get the final guitar solo from all three Beatles, Paul here on the left with the black Les Paul. That's not what he played that day, but he did actually play a Les Paul. Uh, it'll be George here on this Fender Telecaster and it will be John here on this Gibson SG guitar. Any of you guitar freaks out there know, know what those guitars are. So it's gonna be Paul, it's going to be George, and it's going to be John, and you're just going to have to bear with me. You're just going to have to listen for that guitar solo in your head. I'm sorry that we can't have sound on for that, but you can go to YouTube and YouTube the Beatles, the end guitar solo, and there's a couple on there, and this is one of the two best, but unfortunately, no sound. But I'm going to play it, and then I'm going to tell you what's happening. So this is Paul on the first eight beats. Now George comes in for eight beats. Now John comes in for eight beats. Back to Paul. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, that was really exciting for me because I had full sound. Unfortunately, you did not. But the reason I still wanted to go ahead and show you that slide was that part was played live in the studio in one take with all three Beatles, with their guitars, with their amplifiers, sound perhaps bleeding over a little bit from one to the other, but the glory of the Beatles playing as a band, one last time in the studio. Now, uh, Ringo didn't play on that track because he'd already recorded the drum track and they were piping that in over the studio. So I'm sure he was standing there perhaps having a ciggy or, or having a drinking a Coca-Cola, enjoying watching the guys, kind of a dueling guitar part. And for you guitarists, you notice Paul stayed in the middle range, George was in the upper range, and John was playing in the lower range to give you kind of that bassy sound. So what a wonderful way for the Beatles to end their recording career. So now we move on to the tail end of September 69. And what happens there is uh, 
Lennon seeks out on his own to do work with the Plastic Ono Band, uh, somewhat similar to what he had done uh, back at the tail end of 1968 with Eric Clapton. He goes back out with a couple of other fellows, Klaus Vorman, a good friend, and Alan White, who's been the drummer for the uh, band, yes, for the last 50 years. And they perform at the Toronto Pop Festival. And on the way back, uh, John Lennon has decided to leave the Beatles. And uh, he tells Alan Klein, and Alan Klein says, don't say a word to the other guys. We've got a deal coming up, a new royalty deal with capital EMI, and it's going to be signed in a few days. And just be quiet, John. Don't say anything. So John's quiet, and here's the Beatles at the bottom signing that new royalty agreement for Capitol Records for more money for each and every one of their records. Uh, George Harrison evidently couldn't be bothered that day to be there. So it's just the other three guys. And on that day, shortly after this photo is taken and that agreement is signed, John informs the Beatles he's leaving the group. And as sad as that sounds, Paul said, but he says, I'm not going to announce it publicly for a while because I don't want to thwart the sales of our new Abbey Road album. And so Paul says, well, then if you're not announcing it publicly, it's not really happening. So Paul goes along with the illusion that the band is still going to be together. So just six days after John informs the other three Beatles that he's leaving the group, they release their brand new album, Abbey Road. Here's what happens in 1970. We're getting very near the end. And in February 25th of 1970, Paul completes the recording that he has done secretly of his first solo album, and he does it under the pseudonym in Abbey Road Studios as Billy Martin. So if you were to come in and wonder who was on the recording schedule that day, you would not see the name Paul McCartney, so you wouldn't know Paul McCartney was in there recording a solo album you would understand that there was somebody in Studio 2 recording a solo album under the name Billy Martin. And if you think about Billy Shears or Billy Preston and George Martin, the Beatles producer, I'm sure that's how he assembled the name. On February the 26th of 1970, the Beatles release the Hey Jude LP only in the United States. That's only a U.S. issue, and I call that an Apple cash grab from Alan Klein and company. They took a number of Beatles songs that had been released as singles, A and B sides, and they put them all on one album together. So we have songs from I Want to Hold Your Hand to Paperback Writer in Rain to Hey Jude and Revolution, uh, covering a period of at least five years there, all on one record. But Apple knew it could generate some funds, and since they were hemorrhaging cash, this was a good way to do it, but we all bought it anyway. I'm sure you all had it, all you older folks in the audience out there. Uh, March and April, uh, Alan Klein hired Phil Spector, the famous producer over here, this gentleman on the right with the glasses, can be seen here in a later recording session with John, uh, not at that time. And uh, they hired Phil to go back in and do something different with the Get Back let it be out. It's no longer called Get Back. The name got changed someplace in there. So here we are over a year later and we still uh, haven't released this album. A few days after that, April 10th, 1970, Paul publicly announces he's leaving the Beatles, thwarting John, who had announced privately in September he was leaving. Paul now announces publicly and releases his first solo album exactly one week later. Now folks, I don't know what you call that. It's not a coincidence. I call it probably really good marketing. So Paul, ever the marketing guy, ever the business guy, announces publicly he's leaving the Beatles on April 10th and releases his first solo album on April the 17th. Here's what happens from May to December of 17th. On May the 8th, the Let It Be album is released and the film premieres between the 8th and the 13th in London and in New York City. But guess what? No Beatles show up for the premiere of their new film. 
this film that's been worked on since January of 1969 finally sees release on May 8th of 1970 and not one Beatle shows up for the London premiere and not one Beatle shows up for the New York premiere. So that tells you where the Beatles' heads were at that time. A Hard Day's Night, 1964, Help, 1965, and Yellow Submarine was released in Great Britain in 1967. All four Beatles at gala premieres of those three films, not one Beatle at either one of the big Let It Be movie premieres. They've had it, they're tired of it, they've moved on. On May the 26th, George begins recording his All Things Must Pass solo album. Those of you that have this record and remember this record, remember it's a behemoth of an album. It's three records with something like, what, 25 songs on it. Remember what George said in January of 69? He said, I've got all these songs and I have no way to release them. I'm, I'm going to do something with a group of other people and put them out. Still thinking, though, that the Beatles would continue, but obviously that did not happen. And then on December 31st, Paul files for dissolution of the Beatles partnership, the legal Beatles agreement that made those four guys the four most famous musicians and group in the world. Paul says, I want a divorce. And on the last day of 1970, he files for the dissolution of the Beatles partnership. The question that everybody usually asks me anytime we talk about the Beatles is, they wanna know if Yoko was the one that really broke up the Beatles. And if I could play you and you could listen to these various videos, what I have here is Ringo, George, and John all categorically insisting it was not Yoko that broke up the Beatles. George, in the interview that I had prepared to show you here, even says, folks, we had problems long before Yoko ever came on the scene. And as you can see there from, from George's release of a three album set with all these songs he had that he couldn't get onto Beatle Records, he was ready to move along. John's relationship with Yoko is now more important than his relationship to Paul. Paul's relationship to Linda is now more important than his relationship to John or George or Ringo. Ringo already has a family. <coughs> George has already been married a number of years. And so what we've got here is four grown men with families, Paul has a daughter from Linda's previous marriage. Uh, uh, John has a, a son from his previous marriage. Yoko has a daughter from her previous marriage. So everyone, Ringo's got a couple of kids by this time. So everyone but George has a child or multiple children at this point. So they're thinking about their families. They're grown men. They're not kids anymore. So the bottom line is, Yoko was probably a symptom. I think she gets a bad rap. I'm not saying she was an angel through all this, but what I am saying is, is that I do believe that she was about 5% of the cause of the Beatles breakup. It was just time. So I'm not gonna share these videos because you can't really see anything other than the fellas chatting. But if you look them up, look up George Harrison, and John Lennon on the Dick Cavett shows. And there's some really interesting things on YouTube that you can watch that they won't permit us to do through the Facebook Live setting. And as we're wrapping up here on December 19th of 1974, almost four years, I think it's what, 11 days, uh, 12 days short of Paul filing for dissolution of the Beatles partnership the papers are finally being signed. George and Paul signed to dissolve the Beatles at the Plaza Hotel in New York City on that day, 
George has a concert at Madison Square Garden that night, so it was prearranged that Paul would meet him in New York. John is a no-show, even though the Dakota apartment building that he lived in, I googled it, it's 1.1 miles away from the Plaza Hotel. So John couldn't even be bothered to take the five-minute uh, limousine ride from his home at the Dakota down to the plaza to sign these documents. Uh, May Pang, a personal assistant, called and said the stars are not right. John will not be down. Ringo had already previously signed the papers in England, so he was the first to sign. Then the papers were brought across the Atlantic, and the two Beatles uh, in the room at that time signed them. So I'm still going to show you this video because what you can see is the guys uh, signing the paper in the room at the Plaza Hotel. And uh, I had not seen this video to a couple weeks ago. I'm going to fast forward it a bit to get out of this part. Okay, so here, here they are entering the back door of the uh, Plaza Hotel and sneaking up the stairway so fans won't find them. And here they are in the room with their attorneys signing the documents that would officially end the Beatles. And here we see Paul signing the same documents, and he's wearing a wing shirt, surprisingly. This scene is taking place over in London after the announcement has been made. John would not sign the papers that day, as I said. He waited an additional 10 days to sign them. And he's on holiday, or vacation, if you will, with his son, Julian, at Disney World, believe it or not. John took Julian to Disney World, and here he is shown with his personal assistant, May Pang, with a security officer that kind of, you know, guarded the room to make sure people didn't hang around to try to meet John or accost him. Here's young Julian, and here's Julian's mom, Cynthia, John's first wife. That's a little awkward, isn't it? But I'm sure Cynthia came down after the incident a few years earlier with the car wreck. She probably wasn't let Julian out of her sight. So John finally signs the papers to dissolve the Beatles at the Polynesian World Resort in room 1601 of Disney World, Orlando, Florida. So the Beatles are officially dissolved after John signing the documents 10 days later and how ironic that the man that started the Beatles in the late 1950s was the last one to sign the document that dissolved the Beatles. So there's a little picture of the room, and I guess any of us could uh, visit the Polynesian World Resort and probably walk in and find that room, and I'll probably do that when I'm down there this winter. Uh, I wanted to mention some of my references, and then uh, Jen's going to take over and switch off, and we're going to go live. But uh, there's a lot of people I want to thank for the information that we had on here tonight, and that is a lot of great books, and I'll share some of those later with you. And there's a, a list of them there, and then the photos are courtesy uh, of a number of folks there. So I wanted you to be able to see all those names as well. So whenever Jen's ready, we'll... We'll switch off. Um, do you want to take a question real quick? Sure. Okay. Kenneth Womack has a question. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble now. <laughs> uh, does Gary think that there would have been a reunion had John Lennon not been murdered in 1980? Well, Ken, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Are you referring to the Saturday Night Live reunion that uh, 
that Lorne Michaels made an offer. I don't remember the exact offer, but if I recall, it was whatever union scale was uh, at the time for uh, the, the Beatles to appear on Saturday Night Live. So it was it was made as a joke. And if I recall correctly, and Ken, I know you know better than I do, but if I call correctly on the night that offer was made, uh, I believe that John and Paul were together at the Dakota and actually thought seriously about going down to Saturday Night Live and just shocking the world by showing up on the show at that point, if I'm correct. Now, Ken is quite the biographer, so he would know for sure on that. But I'm just going from memory, number one. And uh, number two, I remember a People Magazine article. And again, Ken, you're the expert. Was it Richard Branson? I'm not sure. Uh, that's what I recall, but I may be wrong that made an offer in 1974, around this time. It appeared on the cover of People Magazine, Will They Play Again, I think, for $20 million. And of course, 1974, I mean, 20 million is a lot of money today, but think how much money that was 45 years ago. So uh, to answer your question, Ken, uh, no, I don't think so, as, as much as we all wanted it and as much as we all uh, believe that maybe someday it could happen. Uh, I don't think it would because I think our vision and our image of who the Beatles were by that time, it was so huge in our minds. I just don't see how they could have ever have lived up to our expectations. Uh, I think about the uh, Led Zeppelin concert for Ahmed Erdogan at the O2, I think in 2007, that Led Zeppelin uh, rehearsed for for a few weeks and came back together. Of course, they were missing drummer John Bonham and his son Jason filled in. And they played that one concert. And I was so hoping, because I was one of the people that had applied for tickets to that show, I was one of the, what, 20 million people that applied for tickets and 20,000 got them. And uh, I had seven different email addresses I tried to get them from. So I thought maybe I'd get lucky and hit one of them for two tickets. But, you know, there was uh, there was all, or three of the four members of Led Zeppelin got together for one night, did a one-off show, and I thought they'll tour, and they didn't. So I, I don't know, you know, the, the world had changed They'd all grown up. They had all put out a lot of great solo work and uh, they were all revered on their own as solo artists. I just, uh, you know, I saw a clip of John on Dick Cavett as I was watching some of these uh, clips that didn't work out for us. And, and I was laughing about the one where it says, uh, can you see us up there at the age of 40 singing yesterday? And, you know, he had the quivering in his voice and he said, I told myself, uh, that I would not play She Loves You when I'm 30. And he says, I think I was 25 the last time I played it. Uh, so no, I, I don't see as much as we all wanted that to happen as it ever would. But it's it's a great thought. I wish it would have. I'm going to plug your books in a minute, Ken. All right, we're, we are going to end this live video and we will come right back. Um, Gary's got some stuff to show, and if there's any more questions, um, he can answer. Oh, boy, he's going to grill oh, me. Okay, are we back live? It may take folks a minute or two to get back on. As I'm going to be on Facebook Live here, the things that I show you probably are going to be in reverse. Uh, this is a lovely copy of a, of a book called Wonderful Tonight, which a lovely lady uh, signed for me by the name of Patty Boyd, Patty Boyd Harrison Clapton. And it's a great book to read. It's a, it's a great read. And uh, Patty wrote this about her early life growing up in Africa and then uh, uh, meeting George on the set of A Hard Day's Night, falling in love, getting married, I guess you could say falling out of love, marrying Eric Clapton, and so probably the story of the greatest muse in rock and roll history, songs like Something, Wonderful Tonight, and Layla, 
are all as a result of this uh, lovely lady. And uh, she has a podcast that she does on cooking uh, online now, and uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I watched one of them. So uh, she's a wonderful cook, and she's having a great time. And I met her a few years ago, and she signed this hardcover copy of the book. And so that's one of my cherished possessions. As we uh, wait here for some more folks to uh, show up, do we have folks online, Jen? We got a few folks online. Okay. Well, Ken, I'm going to plug your book. Uh, the guy that's on here that asked that last question is uh, a wonderful, wonderful author. He and I have actually only met one time. I chatted him up at the uh, Beetle Fest convention a few years ago when he released his uh, George uh, Martin two volume uh, set. But if Folks, if you want to have a wonderful book on the things I talked about tonight, the story of Abbey Road and the end of the Beatles, read Solid State by Ken Womack. Uh, great read, awesome writer, and uh, he lays it all out there for us, and it's wonderful. So uh, I would definitely suggest that. It's available on Amazon. And I'm going to plug Ken's most recent book while we're out there. And Ken, I have to admit, I haven't read it yet. I was researching for this program tonight, and I thought I can only read stuff that relates to, to the last days of the Beatles. But it's the 40th anniversary uh, of the loss of John Lennon, and of course it's John Lennon's 80th anniversary year, and Ken has written a detailed book, a book about the last year of John Lennon's life. And I haven't read it yet, but I'm excited. I plan on starting it this weekend, Ken. So. Thanks for another great book. Here's another one of my favorites. I talked a lot about the concert on the roof and, you know, the last concert by the Beatles, and it's written by the man in the white coat. Remember I talked about the man in the white overcoat? This is Ken Mansfield. He was the head of Apple USA, and he wrote this wonderful book, and here's a whole book about that day. And so how much rich detail is in there and all the people and all the characters involved in just what it took to put this Beatles final concert on. Awesome book, wonderful book. Again, available on Amazon. Uh, this is one I've read recently. As a matter of fact, I ran out of time and I didn't complete it. Uh, called And In The End, The Last Days of the Beatles. And these are all relatively new books. These have only been out, uh, most of them only uh, a year or two. And Anne in the End by Ken McNabb is another great uh, document on the end of the Beatles. And then I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this book, Mark Lewis on, uh, with all due respect to a lot of other author, authors, probably the most famous and, I don't know, he's the man. He is just the man. And this is called The Beatles, Tune In. And I want to show you this. That only takes you to 1962, folks. He's working on a second volume. We don't know when it's going to come out. And then there's going to be a third volume. So I'm praying for two things. One, I'm praying Mark Lewis on lives 20 years. And two, I'm praying I live 20 more years. Because that's what it's probably going to take us until he completes this. The detail in this book is unbelievable. And, and you're going to get a laugh out of this. This is the abridged version. There's a version even more complete than this. Every detail you ever thought you wanted to know about the Beatles times 10 is in this book. Also available on Amazon. It's not a plug for Amazon. Go buy it at Barnes & Noble. I don't care. Or your local bookstore. So there we go. That's some of that. Now I wanted to show you some some fun items uh, as we're talking about Abbey Road and such. Uh, here's one of my favorite items that I've got that I didn't see until about two years ago. And I was able to get what I thought was a good deal on eBay. This is a Japanese copy. I put little tags on the back of all my tapes so I know what the sound quality is when I'm uh, uh, looking at them. I'm a geek like that. This is a Japanese copy of the Beatles Abbey Road reel-to-reel -reel tape. Scarce as hen's teeth in America, okay? 
here's the American version, which, yes, of course, I have a mint copy of it. And believe it or not, these 50-year-old tapes play incredibly well. I can't seem to get my spot here. I'm not good being Vanna White, I guess. And then here's a UK. I don't have a UK Abbey Road, but here's a UK revolver. And if you notice the size of it compared to an American. So the American is a seven inch reel. The UK is a five inch reel. And this one happens to be in mono. So it really doesn't play on my stereo recorder, but it's just a nice little unusual thing to have. And, uh, here is the original Revolver 1966, so what's that make it? 54 years old tape, and it would play if I had a mono tape recorder. I've played it on my stereo, but you have to turn it down to one channel. I wanted to mention that the original album cover for the Get Back album, whoops, I got the wrong one up there, was going to be this. This was going to be the Get Back album before the name got changed to Let It Be. And yes, it was going to be a companion to what was before. I didn't bring it, but this originally was the cover of the first British album, the Please Please Me album. So the Beatles were going to bookend this photo taken by a guy by the name of Angus McBean in 1963 and 1970, and uh, he was going to bookend that shot and put it on the Get Back album. But since the Get Back album changed its name to Let It Be, they changed the photography, and so these came out as what we all know in America and love as the Red and the Blue albums. You know, we got the White album, and we know the Red album, we know the Red album, we know the Blue album, and so if you're a Beatle fan and a Beatle collector, You've always referred to those as the Red and Blue albums, the Beatles' greatest hits albums. I wanted to recommend to those of you that don't know, there is an alternate version of the Let It Be album. And here's the original. I'm getting my hands mixed up. Here is the original. I have to go the exact opposite way that's intuitive to go. The original Let It Be CD and the Let It Be Naked CD. So this is Paul McCartney's Revenge, I'll call it. In 2003, this was released, and it was released with the idea that all the fancy stuff that Phil Spector put on this album was removed. That's why it's called Naked. It's the Beatles as nature intended, and Paul got his way and released The Long and Winding Road without Phil Spector's orchestration, Across the Universe by John without orchestration, and uh, I Mean Mine without orchestration. And so, as nature intended, if you don't have this, it's great. You real, you really, if it's one Beatles album you need two copies of, you need Let It Be and Let It Be Naked. Okay? Here's a couple of fun items that I just dug out that I have. And they are uh, early, early cassettes. And look at them. They're in little, they're in cute little trays with little thumb holes to lift them up. So, I uh, gosh, I don't know. I've never played these. They're from uh, probably from uh, you know 1970 or 1971. And then they slide in the little tray there. So there's a Let It Be from my collection. Uh, there's a Paul's first album uh, that we know now was released April 17th, uh, seven, just seven days after Paul announced he was leaving the Beatles. And, uh, here's a copy of that American version of, uh, the Hey Jude, what I call the Apple Cash In album that includes Hey Jude, Old Brown Shoe, Don't Let Me Down, Ballad John and Yoko, Can't Buy Me Love, I Should Have Known Better, Paperback Writer, Rain, Lady Madonna, and Revolution. So all songs released as singles in the U.S., but that had not previously appeared on an album Alan Klein saw an opportunity to cash in. Are we doing any more questions? No. Okay. No. I, uh, I can't talk about Ken without talking about Scott Fryman and this awesome series that Scott's done called Deconstructing the Beatles. And there's a whole series of these. I don't know if there's exactly one for every album. Some have multiple albums on them. But uh, Scott is just an awesome guy. And uh, he goes... Uh, uh, on stage, 
and does a live performance of his Deconstructing the Beatles, and then this is them on a DVD, and you can buy them separately, or you can buy them as a package, and uh, I don't know if there's one for every single album, but there's quite a few. I have about 10 of them, and he breaks down the songs. He breaks down what was happening uh, in the recording studio, and uh, more importantly, he's a musician, and so he breaks down and tell you how the song was created by deconstructing the song. They're awesome if you get a chance. And I don't know if the library would have these or not, but if you can get a hold of them, uh, give them a shot. They're wonderful. Angie has a question for you. Oh, Angie. Okay. Hi, Angie. I know you, Angie. <laughs> Hard Day's Night or Help, which movie is your favorite? Oh, well, you know, I got to go with The Hard Day's Night. Uh, just that old black and white, I won't call it film noir, but, you know, having that old black and white film just really takes you back. If they ever colorized A Hard Day's Night, I don't think I want to see it because that defines the era for me. And I, I was watching a, a, a Dick Cavett interview with John on there, and he says, you know, they, they, the writers came and followed us for three days over three concerts. I think one in England, one in Ireland. I don't know if the other one was in Scotland. And he wrote the whole script based on our life for those three days. And he said he kind of turned us into cartoon characters. But you know what? The natural humor that those guys had. I mean, John Lennon is funny. Ringo is funny. George Harrison has this dry wit. And uh, what can you say about Paul? He's just a cute one, right? And then, of course, we had Wilford Bramble in there from Steptoe and Son as Paul's grandfather. What brilliant casting, and then uh, what is it, Norm, and who's the other guy that are kind of the kind of the Mal and Neil uh, in the movie, and uh, the the comedians, and they're just why why are you always being taller than me when the other guys like Sitzens is taller? So uh, yeah, hard day's night, but help, you know, I still love it, and I think the plot totally is a takeoff on the whole James Bond thing that we were all in love after Doctor No and Goldfinger. So we get the Beatles in kind of a James Bond caper. And uh, I will tell you this much, Angie. Uh, many, many years ago, we had a Dalmatian. And uh, his name was Kaili. So I guess that gives you an idea that I, that I love help uh, as well. But I got to give Hard Day's Night the nod uh, over help. But gosh, the music in both of those is so great. So thanks for asking that. <laughs> Here's one of my favorite pieces that sits proudly in my home. This is, uh, this is not cardboard, this is metal, porcelain, uh, just like the ones in Abbey Road, and no, I didn't steal it. And the way you can tell I didn't steal it is if I stole it, it would already had writing all over it. It would have had a thousand signatures or so-and-so was here on it. But I actually bought this, I think I bought it at the St. John's Tube Station like 25 or 30 years ago. And I don't even know if they make them anymore, but they don't put them up anymore. They don't put them on the walls around Abbey Road unless they're 20 feet in the air. Some of them are really high so that you can't climb up there and get them off. But if they're down low, they just painted them now because everybody stole them. Who wouldn't want one of these in their room? But I got this one legally and it's a, definitely a prized possession. Speaking of help, Angie, just for you, uh, this is one of my prized possessions, and don't come to my house looking for it. I keep it in a safe deposit box. It's getting a little old, and it's getting a little faded, uh, but I bought this off of a gentleman about 25 years ago uh, before they were faking so much stuff on eBay, and uh, he is a well-renowned dealer, and then I had an autograph expert by the name of Frank Caezo authenticate it, uh, but it is all four Beatles signatures, as you can see. Uh, John signed in blue pen. I wish they all had the black pen of uh, Paul, Ringo, and George is fading out somewhat. But as you can see, Angie, it's the Beatles Bahama special with the Beatles with two T's, which I think George has circled because he sees it and thinks it's funny. And it was, what, March 1965. And so this is during the Beatles trip to the Bahamas to record the Bahamian segment of Help. They recorded, of course, in London, 
They recorded in Salzburg, Austria, or filmed rather, and they filmed in the Bahamas. So. I wanted to show you some fun magazines that I've loved over the years, and some of you may even have these, or you could even, you know, pick them up at the, if you're at the right garage sale time. One of my personal favorites has got to be the Abbey Road cover, and I know it's a little shiny there, but if you look closely, what's happened, a steamroller has come by because it's typical National Lampoon, and it's flattened the Beatles with the steamroller there in the background. So that was from 1977. That's one of my favorites. This is absolutely one of my favorite uh, all-time covers from 1967. The Beatles on the cover of Time magazine. And that is, I think, paper mache or decoupage. Uh, but it deteriorated and fell apart a long, long time ago. Uh, for you folks that love Mad Magazine, yes, they lampooned the Beatles. And they put Alfred E. Newman up there as the Maharishi after the Beatles had visited India. And actually down below, we have the actual Maharishi holding Alfred P. Newman up with the other four Beatles and Mia Farrow, who was there for the ride in Rishikesh along with the other four. Uh, here's some neat, uh, this is a uh, sheet music. This is English sheet music uh, and it's unusual. I, I love to try to collect the more obscure songs. I mean, how many people bought Maxwell's Silver Hammer to perform on guitar or piano? I don't know. I don't have much interest in it. But here is the uh, UK uh, sheet music for Maxwell. Here's the UK uh, sheet music for Get Back. I do love that image. It appears on a few other pieces of English sheet music, but what a wonderful, wonderful image. Uh, the artist that did that, kudos. That's awesome. Here's the American Come Together sheet music from Abbey Road. I've got to show you this one because it is so darn hard to find. I've only ever seen it one other time in my life. And so I grabbed it in spite of the fact that I don't know if Falil, I don't know if that's a last name or a first name, and then they three-hole punched it to put it in a notebook, but where are you going to find a sheet music copy of a fairly obscure White Album song, Long, Long, Long by George Harrison off the White Album. So you can get back in the USSR, and there's tons of Obladi Obladas out there, but try finding another copy of Long, Long, Long. So even with this on it, I still love it. And no, I'm not going to try to erase it because I'll take George's face and his mustache right <laughs> off with it. We have a question. Yes. Um, from Elizabeth. Do you know what inspired the song Maxwell's Silver Hammer? Uh, I don't know exactly, Elizabeth, but I do know this much. Uh, Paul went to some type of a scientific symposium or meeting and heard the word pataphysical pataphysical, and he wrote it down like many writers are prone to do. I've listened to a lot of songwriters, even went to a couple songwriting seminars, and you were always encouraged to take notes and write down your thoughts. And if you've ever been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Bruce Springsteen famously had books and books full of his thoughts and song potential t song titles. So uh, Paul had written down this word pataphysical looked up what it meant, and wanted to build a song around it. So I don't know the inspiration for it, but I will tell you, we didn't have time for that in the session, that Maxwell's Silver Hammer was dreaded by every single Beatle. Ringo said it was mad. It went on forever. Maxwell's Silver Hammer, I mentioned clear back during the White Album sessions because it was being worked on during the White Album, and Al Broadax, who produced the Yellow Submarine uh, film, heard it in the studio as the Beatles were working on it and asked George Martin when the song would be done, it would be perfect for our new Yellow Submarine movie. And of course, George said, well, I don't know, the fellows are working on it, but I don't know if it'll be completed in time. And of course, 
It didn't get on the White album. It didn't get on the Yellow Submarine soundtrack. It didn't get on the Get Back, Let It Be album. It finally makes its way onto Abbey Road. John would not participate. He hated it. And George said in an interview one time, Paul wants to release a new song that he has as a single, but I don't think we should because it's about a guy that murders people. <laughs> so that's what I can tell you about uh, Maxwell Silver Hammer. But uh, funny, and as my friend Mike Bechtel says, but it's just a little bit dark. So here's another nice piece. Here's a, here's a wonderful get back sheet music. And what's the B-side of get back? Don't let me down. I just got that from uh, Paul Wayne at Tracks in England a couple of weeks ago. That's a hard one to find. A wonderful song by John, Don't Let Me Down. And of course, that's the B-side and the A-side is Get Back. A couple other little pieces here I'll show you real quick. I just got a couple more. Uh, this is an Apple catalog from June of 1973. So it would have all the albums and singles and various artists that, that were out, uh, that were current in June of 1973. And the gentleman that signed this to my wife and I has passed away now. Love and Peace, Alistair Taylor, 1988. And Alistair Taylor uh, was Mr. Fix-It for the Beatles. He was Brian Epstein's assistant at NEMS, which was the record store Brian owned. And the day that Brian went to the cavern to see the Beatles and decided he was going to become their manager, this man, Alistair Taylor, was with him. So what a wonderful day back in 1988 when my wife and I got to meet Alistair and he signed this little Apple catalog for me and it's been a cherished possession. He is no longer with us. He wrote a wonderful book. I think it's out of print, but I think it's called Mr. Fix-It of all the things that he had to do for the Beatles. And if John said, I want to buy a church on the Isle of Wight, it was Alistair's job to go find a church for John to buy. Unfortunately, by the time he found a couple churches John could buy, John didn't want to buy a church anymore. Ringo was having a party one night, and about a, it was about a week away, and he said, I'd like my friends that come to the party to be able to play American billiards, not snooker or whatever they called in England on a different size table. I want an American pool table. For my, and I told people like Eric Clapton, we're going to have an American pool table at the party, and they're all excited. So he says to Alistair, you got to find me one. You got a week. So Alistair called the Brunswick Company in America and asked for the distributors in England. And they said, yeah, we don't, we don't really have American pool tables over there. They don't sell. But he said, we do have a few on American military bases in England. And so Alistair said, well, do you have any names of your contacts? And so he got the names of contacts at American military bases and called a couple and said, look, I just need to borrow an American pool table. Well, why would we loan it to you? Well, it's for Ringo Starr. Oh, okay, when would you like to pick it up? <laughs> so that's the influence the Beatles had. Here's a little piece I have. It's an actual piece, whoops. It's an actual piece of Apple stationery and it's stamped 16th of July, 1971. Uh, I had just graduated from high school a week before, so that tells you how old it is. And here, clear on the bottom, I don't know if I can get it up there. There it is, Apple Core Limited, 3 Savile Row, London. So that's a piece of, of letterhead. Uh, I don't know what it was used for, but it's just it got a couple of uh, stamps on it. I imagine somebody was checking the ink or re-inking their stamp and stamped it, and then it just got, I don't know if it got pitched, it's completely flat, but... Uh, I ended up with it, but I thought it was a wonderful uh, thing to have. So I think my last thing that I have. I have a question. Oh, we got a question. Okay, I've got one more thing um, to show. Karen is asking, where were you on December 8th, 1980? How did you hear the news? Uh, Karen, that's interesting. Uh, my wife finds this hard to believe, but I was not a professional football fan in 1980. <laughs> uh, she'd be shocked to hear that now because she'd go, you watch football all the time. But I can tell you that on December 8th, 1980, on that Monday night, I was not watching Monday night football, which is where the world, or at least the United States, uh, first heard it. And uh, 
Uh, I watched a, uh, an interview one time. I want to say Frank Gifford, Don Meredith, and Howard Cosell, I believe. And the news came in, and they were told they had to announce John Lennon's, this is running chills up my spine, they were told they had to announce John Lennon's assassination uh, after they came back from commercial. And Frank Gifford said, I didn't know him. Who do you think should do it? And Don Meredith said, well, I didn't know it. And Howard said, we were friends. I was friends with John. I'll do it. And so Howard Cosell made the decision because he was a personal friend of John Lennon that he would go on air, I think it was ABC, right? Monday Night Football and announce to the world that John Lennon had been shot and killed uh, in New York City. So I didn't watch the show that night and I did not find out until the next morning. I went to work on Tuesday. I was numb for most of the day. I probably came home early. I had a meeting on Wednesday night with a food dealers group in Canton, Ohio. I had never missed a meeting. I called them at noon on Wednesday and I said, uh, I can't make it tonight. I just said, I'm not gonna be able to make it. I didn't, I didn't tell them why. Uh, I, just, I just couldn't go sit in that meeting all night. Uh, I stayed at home, I played Beatle music. And of course, here we are 40 years later. Uh, my daughter was, uh, my wife was eight months pregnant and my daughter was born, or yeah, not quite eight months, seven months pregnant. My daughter was born about seven weeks later. So when I think about my lovely daughter uh, gonna turn 40 on January 23rd of uh, uh, 2021, uh, I have to look back and say, she never lived at a time when John Lennon walked the earth and that just that just blows my mind. But believe me, she knows who John Lennon is. Hey, I wanna show you uh, the last piece I have here. There was no significance to showing you one thing before another. It was just how they were laying here on the desk. But I looked for this item for, for 20 years and I found it about two years ago. Of course, you know where I found it on eBay, right? And uh, I'll tell you what's significant about it. It says uh, the new Far Out Beatles, and it's got this wonderful, wonderful uh, picture uh, of the Beatles on it. And it's dated uh, July 24th, 1967. So right after the release of the Sgt. Pepper album on the 1st and 2nd of June, 1967. So a few weeks later, and you can see up here, whoops, clear over here, Asia edition. So it's the Asian edition of Life Magazine. This does not exist in this form in the United States. You cannot go out and get this edition of Life Magazine, U.S. edition, with this photo on the cover. However, you can get it with this photo in the middle of the magazine where the article about the Sgt. Pepper record is, but I always wanted this cover and I found a guy on eBay from the Philippines that had it, and it took me three weeks to get it. Uh, and uh, I was so excited when I received it after looking for it for 20 years. But if you want a copy of the American version, look for the Life magazine with the Israel, what was it, the Seven Days War, the Six Days War? My wife always corrects me, maybe it was the Eight Day War, but it was that very short war uh, between uh, uh, the uh, Israelis and the Arabs there uh, in Jerusalem that took place over seven or eight days in 1967. And at the last minute, the Beatles were cut from that cover and a picture of war-torn Israel was put on the front and this was moved into the uh, near the center section. So uh, it's a hard one to find but I think it's a wonderful image of the Beatles. It's not in perfect condition, but uh, 
I'll have it the duration of my lifetime, and then my wife and kids can figure out what to do with it after that. So that's all I've got. You going to wrap us up, Jen? Yeah. I think that's it. If there's uh, no more questions, we will um, we will say good night. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you had a good time. I am so sorry that we did not have live sound on those videos. Uh, uh, hopefully, the next time we do this, we'll be able to do it in a live setting. We won't have to worry about that. So. Yes. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>